All right. I wanted to start by saying for those, we have several people who are new to our committee. And one of the things I wanted to say is, oh my heavens, will you look at that? Hello, Charlotte. Oh, bye, Charlotte. <laughs> okay. One of the things I wanted to say is that I learned the most when I was first on this committee uh, by listening to the questions that my colleagues asked. And so I hope you will all, all of us who are new and all of us who are a little bit more experienced and then those who are very experienced <laughs> will um, appreciate and listen carefully to the kinds of questions colleagues ask. Like, is this one phase? Is this three phases? What money have you used before? How will this go forward? All of the very prudent questions that I didn't know to ask when I first started, and they've taught me so much. So I really urge you to listen to the most experienced folks on our committee, listen to the kinds of questions they ask. And I wish John were here because he also asks wonderful questions, some of which we heard when we viewed various sites on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I wanna publicly thank um, Heather for making that those site visits on Saturday so successful. So Heather, thank you so much. Those were terrific. And I want a, a shout out to, um, uh, to Marcia Rasmussen who attended so many of those um, on a Saturday. Um, and that was really grand. And so I wanna, I wanna thank her very much. Uh, and so um, we now begin, <laughs> so, as they say, now the lesson begins. Um, the, um, so it, as again, just, just to um, remind us that listening to each other's questions, following up on those questions is really wise. Now, for those who have, are, have not had the experience of presenting to the um, CPC, different members of the CPC take on different um, projects. They read them with a particular detail, they follow them through. Afterwards, if there are more questions, they follow those through. So we have, a, we have several people who are you know, ready to do that and, and ready to do that um, and, and reflect the kind of experience. Whoops, I think you've just lost me, but that's okay. I think I'll be right back. <laughs> You're with us. You're there with us. Go. Okay, thank you. Um, th that we um, we um, and then we can follow up with certain people. So the first project, Heather, is now that I've done this, I've lost my screen that shows which which project is first. We just have to do a roll call to call That's the right. meeting to order. Thank you. So let's let's do that and let's let's start with Peter. Peter, can you start us off, please? Sure, uh, Peter Ward, uh, Vice Chair and uh, Select Board Appointee. Thank you, Peter. Tom. Thank you, uh, Tom Kern, Select Board Appointee. Thank you so much. Paul, good morning. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, Paul Bone. No, a little disoriented, go ahead, Paul, hi. Paul Bone, Recreation Commission Appointee. Thank you so much. Hi, Charles, your turn. Uh, Charles, you're muted, hon. I think we should all get t-shirts. We've all talked that says you are muted. <laughs> we can't hear you. Charles Phillips, appointee of the Concord Housing Authority. Thank you, Charles. And I hope you had a chance to listen to the select board discussion last night um, and some of the funding questions that, that stand ahead for all of us in terms of affordable housing. Sarah. Uh, Sarah Grimwood, um, Natural Resources Commission appointee. Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome. Nancy Nelson. Nancy Nelson, uh, Historical Commission. Thank you. I don't see Burton Flynn here right now. And I know that um, and that I, I know that our friend John Cressley is not going to be here. So um, let us let us proceed. The first, the first, uh, and I also want to welcome all those people who took the time <laughs> to present such thoughtful grant proposals to have a chance for us to discuss them with you. I mean, they're really, they're really remarkable. So Heather, what is the first, what is the first proposal? Um, if, I, so that, if I had not been in New Hampshire, I could have printed out the agenda, but we have literally just rushed in the door. So go ahead. No worries. The first um, project to present tonight is the Concord Oral History Preservation and Access Project. And I believe Anka Voss will be presenting. Anka this. Hello, Anka. Welcome. Hello, Diane. How are and you? Wonderful. And Anka, I'm the one that is following carefully your work. So can you okay. can you talk Great. to us about your proposal and present it just a little bit for everyone to hear? Yes, I will. Um, and first of all, thank you so much to you, um, Diane, and the members of the committee for inviting me um, to present this proposal and for considering this proposal. Um, I'm really grateful. 
Um, so in order to do my proposal, I'm actually going to um, share my screen. And I think you can do that. Is she able to share her screen, Heather? Okay. Th yes. Thank you, Anka. Okay. Gloria. Um, can you see my screen? We can. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and I'm, and as you can see, I'm working from home. And so um, I, um, yeah, I think this will be fine. Um, you see me on my other screens on the side as well. That's right. <clears throat> That's okay. Um, so um, again, thank you so much um, for inviting me um, today to present this project and um, to tell you a little bit more about the goals of the Concord Oral History Preservation and Access Project. <clears throat> the presence of the rich holdings and special collections of which the oral history program's collection is an integral part are very much of the result of the vision of one man and the support of the Concord community over the years. William Monroe was born in Concord in 1806, but entered the dry goods business and worked in Boston as a clerk and then as a buyer. He moved to New York City, where he suffered a catastrophic setback, losing everything in a fire in, 1870, in 1835. He regrouped and decamped to London, where he was based from 1835 until the early 1850s. In London, William served as the overseer uh, and buyer for Boston, in Boston import and export firm, and this is where he made his fortune. Just prior to the Civil War, William retired from professional life. He returned to Boston, but spent time at his family's home on the corner of Main Street and Academy Lane every summer here in Concord. Mm -hmm. It was at this time in his life that the idea of the library took shape. He purchased the real estate for the library in 1869 and arranged for the widening of Main Street to accommodate the library building as well as for the movement of neighboring houses when Main Street was enlarged. Hmm. Hmm. Construction of the library began in 1872 and the library was dedicated on October 1st, 1873. Monroe also conceived of a unique approach to maintain and oversee the library and negotiate with the officials from the town of Concord, Middlesex County, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to create a public-private partnership that still operates today. And I believe that the Concord Oral History Program is an excellent example of this enduring partnership. Special collections officially began with the founding of the Concord Street Public Library in 1873 and the far side of the request of the library committee of which Walter Emerson was a member for citizens to donate material of local significance to ensure an appropriate gift of the present generation for posterity. The William Monroe Special Collections abundantly documents the history of Concord and sheds light on the full range of Concord individuals, events, institutions, and organizations. We hold books, archival manuscripts, materials, pamphlets, ephemera, broadsides, maps, photographic holdings, and fine art. We also hold the historical records of the town of Concord. All of these materials are used by students, family historians, and academic researchers looking to learn more about Concord's past. Special collections also currently holds and houses and administers the Concord Oral History Program, which is a collection of almost 500 recordings of Concordium spanning the last 50 years. This screenshot is of our online portal on the library website where you can listen to and read a portion of those interviews.
David Little, was one of the first people in um, 1977 who agreed to be interviewed. And you can read his interview on the library website. The audio recording, however, of his interview from 1977 is only available on cassette tape and currently is not available to be listened to. Um, thankfully, um, David also um, participated in other interviews. Um, so we have, I think, almost four of his oral histories. But this initial one, which again was one of the earliest, we have a transcript, but um, the audio recording is currently not available. How did Concord's oral history program get its start? Under the direction of Marjorie Garrett in 1976, the, oral, the Historical Commission established an oral history subcommittee to quote, coordinate and carry out a program for the collection of an oral history of the town. A large number of residents of diverse backgrounds and interests will eventually be contacted and asked to re-respond re to this program by recording their recollections of the town as it was. That was the 1976 town report. By 1977, local historian Renee Gerlich had already recorded 30 his histories, which the commission reported, quote, are highly professional in the beginning of fulfilling a long time goal of the commission and other local historians. And that was from the town report of 1977. Through 2006, local historian Renee conducted the interviews and Nancy McKinney transcribed them. Photographer Alice Milton's portraits also form an important part of the collection through 2006. Of course, unfortunately, Renee passed away in 2007. Since then, between 2018 and 2016, oral history interviews were conducted by independent contractors, Michael and Carrie Klein of Talking Across the Lines and transcribed by Adept Word Management. This association ended a few years ago and the program has been relatively inactive since then. From its inception, the Town of Concord through the Concord Historical Commission has funded this program with additional support provided by the Gerlich family, with joint oversight and administration by the commission and the Concord Free Public Library and special collections. All recordings and transcriptions associated and associated documents are the property of Concord. The collection is housed and made accessible in the William Monroe Special Collections of the Concord Free Public Library. <clears throat> the oral histories are accessed frequently and have connected many researchers with Concord's history and the stories of its residents. One of the earliest interpretations came in the form of a book authored by Renee Gerlich and Bill Bailey. David Little served as the advisor to the book. In, 18, in 1983, following a shared presentation at Concord Academy with Bill Bailey, chair of the history department on what is a, on, on a discussion of what is a Concordian, presenters and audience members agreed <laughs> that it was time for a history of Concord in the 20th century. We know less about Concord in, the 19, in 1944 than in 1844, one attendee observed. So in 1985, in commemoration of, the, of its 350th birthday, Rene Gerlich co-wrote the book, Concord in the Days of Strawberries and Streetcars, an illustrated history of everyday life in Concord at the turn of the century up to World War II. In her introduction, Rene discussed how the book is a window to community life during the 20th century, adding new dimensions to Concord history. Drawing on her research and the oral histories she had conducted up to that point, the book gives voice to the people who in the past may have remained invisible. <clears throat> Renee also invited Bill Bailey to write a chapter in the book on the immigration or the immigrant experience based on Bill's interviews with local residents. In a recent episode of Concord Stories, a new virtual series um, that I started this past year, which highlights holdings in special collections 
I had the pleasure of speaking with Bill about the oral histories he conducted with conference immigrant communities. And this recording and presentation um, with Bill is available on the library's website. Bill set out to conduct nearly 70 interviews with immigrants from Ireland, Canada, Norway, Italy, Russia, and Poland. And um, again, I invite you to listen to Bill's presentation and discussion um, on our website um, and learn about this really important documentation project. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many of the recordings that I've been discussing, including all of the recordings that were conducted by Bill, so about 70 um, interviews, are available only on cassette tape and in danger of being lost due to the shelf life of audio cassettes. Currently, less than 200 of the 500 oral history recordings are digitized and only a portion of the oral hist history transcripts are accessible via the library's website. This application seeks funding to digitize and transcribe the remaining tapes. Um, and he, here's just a sample, sample from our vault um, of some of the documents um, that, again, currently are really not accessible um, to the public. <clears throat> Included in the recordings that are currently only stored on audio cassette or not transcribed, again, are Bailey, are um, Bill Bailey's interviews, um, a history project that focused on Canantum, um, one on the Minutemen home care um, workers, a veterans oral history project, and um, finally about. 10 tapes of miscellaneous oral histories um, that have been conducted um, over the years. Just as it was envisioned by the library committee in 1873, the oral histories are a gift of the present generation for posterity. Your funding would assist us to preserve and make available these valuable resources for the future preparing them um, for being available online um, at the, on the library's website um, through a new portal that we're developing. Um, and here's just a screenshot um, because we have um, already posted other historical documents to this online portal. Again, the steps will allow us to preserve and make these invaluable resources accessible thereby increasing knowledge about Concord's historic and cultural resources. Thank you so much um, for listening to my presentation and um, please let me know if you have questions. Anka, so much like you, this is such a professional presentation and thank you so much. Simply to read <laughs> your resume, uh, almost seven pages long, which is in our uh, which is in the, the, the program that you presented is enough to humble all of us. The vision that the, <laughs> the, vision that the library, the people had 150 years ago is one that you're obviously hoping to um, preserve and to honor. I have a variety of questions I'd like sure. to ask you. Sure. Um, are there no library funds or town funds that can support this? Many of the CPC applications include supporting resources uh, from the town, from uh, the Concord Free Public Library resources or the, or the, the, the trustees, um, the corporation. I mean, is, is none of that funding, um, how, how has that been, it, it, how, what can you tell us about that? So, yes, um, there are different parts really. Um, so I think in the application I discussed and I, you know, I didn't put a dollar amount of it because that phase really had completed and I'm not asking for funding for that. But phase one really um, was um, extensive hours spent by um, my staff member, um, Jesse Hopper, um, who um, now has been hired as, as a 
um, permanent employee, you know, at the Concord Food Public Library in special collections as a special collections assistant. But oh, during COVID, you know, when we were closed to the public, but the library was um, working very hard um, behind closed doors. Um, one of the projects that I assigned Jesse on was to create, and that was included in the packet um, in my application, um, what I considered a phase one um, is to inventory the entire oral history project and collection. There had never been, there was no comprehensive index um, of the oral history collection. We did not know um, the different projects that actually consist of this oral history project. Um, so, you know, I knew Renee's work, um, but um, I did not know um, from just our web presence what other tapes existed, what other oral histories um, were stored in the shelf in the collection, which oral histories had transcripts, which didn't have transcript, um, in what form they were in. Um, so, you know, again, we have um, the audio recordings. Um, and so the inventory that I included, I considered phase <laughs> one. I didn't put a dollar amount on that, um, but um, I can certainly, um, you know, um, maybe work with Jesse to reconstruct um, the time that she spent on inventorying, um, creating that inventory, um, which took quite some time um, and, you know, gathering all that, you know, what we call in, in archival, in, in archival library speak metadata about each of the oral histories. Um, but again, it was, um, a tedious task, but I thought it was really important in order for me to make a uh, plan going forward about how to handle these oral histories. I mean, you have to have an assessment of what your content is and what its needs, what its needs are before you can move forward. So we invested that money and, you know, that funding um, was um, funding that came um, from the town. I, that's wonderful, and I wish you would add that to your proposal, okay. uh, because its absence is is notable in comparison to other, not something you would know, but in comparison to other applications. Mm -hmm. uh, you you've listed a three phase program. Would you consider the application you're making right now for the second phase or the yes? Third? Mm -hmm. That's how I articulated. There's a small paragraph in the application right. where I. Um, identified phase one. Again, I did not put a dollar amount um, on phase one, um, but I believe you know, that was a significant contribution um, that has already been made um, you know, in preparation for phase two. Phase three um, will be the work that will take place after we receive the transcriptions and um, digitized oral histories to make them available online. And my hope is because, you know, I, I, I'm a department of two um, and um, I don't necessarily have um, hours um, to do that processing um, in my schedule and Jess's schedule um, as we serve the public, you know, um, um, five days a week in special collections. However, um, I work closely with Simmons University and actually this semester I already have two practicum students who are working on projects in special collections. And my plan would be that, um, you know, in af what, if the funding is a, were to be approved that um, I would assign um, one or two um, practicum students to do the work of um, actually processing the content and making it available online. Thank so you. I would so, not be requesting additional funds um, yeah. to actually um, make this content available online. That's brilliantly clarifying. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, um, how, um, how many tapes have already been digitized? And has that, you say that there are 241 that have not. How 341. Many, how many have not been? 341. 341, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But some have been digitized already or not? Yes, yes. So there's about a total of about 500. Okay. 
and 341 of those have not been digitized. Have not been digitized. Okay. And okay. I think, you know, one thing I, in the context of preservation, I think what I wanted to also clarify is, you know, yes, I have, I, even in special collections, um, I have a, a machine that uh, can transfer tape uh, to an, an MP3 file or actually a, a WAV file. I can't remember, I think it's an MP3 file. Um, however, these are tapes. If you think about the tape that was um, recorded of David, that tape has been sitting in a box since 1977. <laughs> actually, um, the, you know, the best practice and recommendation is that I would not put that tape in a tape player, um, that you actually provide, put that, bring that tape to a professional to assess its um, state because the tape itself could have deteriorated to a point that a regular tape player could snap that tape or damage in another way. So, which is why, you know, rather than doing this work in house, you would hire a, a vendor who has the professional equipment and skills to make those assessments. Thank you. Any of us who still have tape players <laughs> and, and have old tapes understand the, the vulnerability of all that. Um, a question that I'm sure the, um, the Historic District Commission has discussed. Yep. I, know, I know Melissa will be sending a letter. We don't have it yet. And I know Sherry Litwack will be sending us a letter, which is also not yet here, but we have some strong supporting letters in any case. Um, how are the voices chosen? We hear some voices of immigrants, but when you run down the list of names um, of people who have been interviewed, it has a slightly patrician tone to it, a very Concordian um, tone to it. Mm -hmm. How, how, how um, are the voices that are being solicited and are being recorded chosen? And who has oversight of that? So currently, you know, the oral history project, um, certainly since I started um, at the library and I've been here since fall 2019, um, we have not conducted um, new oral histories except that, you know, I have developed this virtual series called Concord Stories where, you know, I am talking and recording um, um, conversations. But the oral history project has, um, you know, in the past, um, had, um, you know, it, different individuals um, that have uh, contributed to the selection. Um, I think, you know, Renee, you know, obviously played a very central role. I mean, she really um, ran the program um, from the 70s through um, 2007. Um, so she worked um, in, a, you know, I, I think David Little probably had you know, influence too in making those selections. Um, and again, I commend also Renee for, you know, reaching out to Bill uh, Bailey um, to fill a, sp a specific gap or, or piece of the narrative of Conquer that, you know, up to that point hadn't been covered in those world histories. And I think going forward, I think it would be very wise. Um, and I, I believe, um, now, I, I can't recall now if our inventory um, has it broken down, um, again, based on, you know, gender, um, race and ethnicity um, to see, you know, what the makeup of those oral histories are. But obviously going forward, um, if we were to add to that collection and, you um, make um, decisions about who to um, interview. Um, I would hope that you know, I could invite a group of um, representatives from, the, from you know, your committee and uh, other um, Concordians and, and organizations that might have um, some recommendations about how we should go about continuing this process. Um, and I would absolutely invite suggestions and um, recommendations and um, and of course you know the oral history program is coordinated um, 
under the direction of the Concord Historical Commission. So, right. you know, I, um, you know, it is possible, um, um, maybe that Melissa would have um, some um, um, history on, on some of those decisions um, over the years um, and how they were made and how the selections were made, but um, Thank you, Anka, so helpful. Melissa, I see her hand is up. I'm gonna call on her before I ask our committee because she may be addressing this. Hi, Melissa. Go Hi, ahead. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, Anka hasn't been here that long. Uh, the um, oral history program has, as she, as she has indicated, has sort of been managed uh, by Renee for a while, but uh, at that time also very strongly with the input of Barbara Powell, who was then the library director. And after uh, Barbara left, it became much more under the realm of Chris Whalen as town manager. Uh, and since Anka has come on board, I have met with her, um, Heather's been with me, Heather Gill and I've met with Anka to resurrect the program, um, to, to broaden it, because Anka has had some great ideas about ways we could have uh, seniors, seniors of the community be interviewed by seniors of the high school. I mean, we totally recognize that we want a much more broad, um, broad uh, view of the town that was that is represented by oral histories. Uh, but the other program that we actually are doing, which um, Anka's got a lot in her plate because uh, <laughs> there's a major building project going on as well. Uh, we have been interviewing uh, members of the Emerson Hospital staff, um, wow. working with. Uh, uh, Carlene Hempel, who is a West Concord resident. She's a professor of journalism at Northeastern University, and she's actually been conducting the interviews. I think she's got six done. I don't think she's, I'm not sure she's given them to you, Anka, yet, but yet. Um, she's got another six or so to go. Um, and this obviously is to document the experience of COVID with oh, our uh, local hospital. And there are a real variety of people. Yes, she's interviewed Chris Schuster, the CEO, but she's also interviewed housekeeping staff. So I, I think Anka and I share the view that we need to, again, get a, a broader cross-section of Concord represented in these oral histories. And the other thing I would just like to bring up um, in answer to your question, Diane, about funding. You know, I was president of the library for many years. That's president of the trustees. And the trustees are committed to special collections and provide a fair amount of money every single year, but they can't fund everything. And I, you know, it struck me that, um, cause I encourage Anka to, to uh, apply for this grant um, that there are other sources of funds uh, that perhaps be a way to help finance this really important project. Melissa, thank you so much. That clarification can be nothing but helpful to our committee. Um, and now, now I'll turn to our committee members. Peter, you have a question and then Paul. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that, that presentation. You're welcome. Um, two questions that are closely related. One is given the, the scope of the undertaking, do you feel that your funding request is um, inclusive of a contingency? And secondly, um, looking at phase three, which is the overhaul of the online platform, which is probably a significant effort, would you anticipate coming back to the CPC at another point in time for funding for phase three? You know, I don't think so. I mean, we actually, uh, again, during COVID, um, have um, worked on developing this new platform. Um, it is um, an open source platform called the Mecca. And both um, Jesse, my the special collection system that I have experience um, in our previous work um, history of working with the Omeka platform. And you can actually look it up. It's oh, just Omeka, O-M-E-K-A. Um, you can't see our site. Uh, our site is currently still hidden, um, but there are lots of um, um, universities, um, historical societies, um, and museums that use a Mecca. So again, we've already made a lot of progress in developing our platform. Again, um, also a Mecca is an open source software um, platform, exhibit platform that is taught 
at um, in library programs, information science programs, and archives programs. So, um, you know, the students um, that are at Simmons will have had training in Omeka and are probably going to be very, very excited to have an opportunity to um, get additional experience um, doing this work. So I do not, um, I don't expect that um, I will need additional funding to make that happen. I'm, I feel pretty confident between myself and Jesse and um, our Simmons students um, who um, are always eager to come work in special collections at the Congress of Public Library that we'll be able to um, complete that final phase. Peter, is that okay? Do you, do you have a yes, follow-up? thank you. Okay, thank you. Paul. Hi, thank you, Anka. great presentation, thank you. You're welcome. Um, just a quick question, clarifying question. Absolutely. I, I understand there are about 500 interviews and you want to complete the, digi the audio uh, digitization. Is the ultimate goal to have a complete set of audio recordings and written recordings, uh, excuse me, written transcripts available? So two parallel um, efforts, is that, is that the ultimate goal? Yes, so right now we actually have transcriptions of, of a large number of the oral histories and you can read them on our website, um, but the audio um, is not available and because it is still just on cassette. Uh, and I believe that while it is wonderful to have the transcripts, um, you know, it is um, the idea of, or the purpose of, of, of having an oral history rather than just asking somebody to write down the recollections is that we want to have a living um, memory of, of that individual. We want to hear their voices. We want to hear the intonations. We want to hear the emphasis. Um, it brings to life their recollection in a way that um, you know, the written text alone um, can do to an extent, but you know, again, the um, intent of an oral history is to pr provide a much richer um, representation of those stories and those, those recollections. Um, so yes, so the oral history project, again, currently there are about 500 oral histories that we hold um, and administer um, collaboratively you know, with the historical commission um, and have for since its inception um, or in the inception of the program. Of the 500 oral histories, um, we've digitized um, a little over one, I believe about, about 130 have been, right. have been digitized or are, av are available online at the Concord Free Public Library. So if you go to the website um, under special collections, there's a link to oral histories and you will see links to, that are to MP3 files that you can listen. You'll actually see even just the inventory online there are lots of oral histories where there is no place to click um, to listen to the oral history. You can read the transcript, but um, it just says there a cassette. So there are out of the 500 oral histories, we have about 341 oral histories that are currently only available on audio cassette. Right. And right. those audio cassettes are not, their condition is not improving with time. So it's really, yeah. I believe, really important to salvage them now um, because a lot of work and a lot of thought um, has been put into, and care has been put into this project. And I want to make sure that it is preserved. Okay, oh, a quick, 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 quick follow-up. Yes. The, uh, about half the proposals for the transcription services for the 70, I guess the 70, um, the 70 records that haven't been transcribed yet. Uh, are those 70, is that a subset of the 341? Um, some are, some are not. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's yes. a good question. Those are good questions. Thank you so much. Sarah. Um, okay, I just wondered, you did, you, you made reference to the fact that um, with these cassette tapes that have been sitting for some time in a box, you don't know what sort of state they're in. Does the funding you've asked for take into account if there is any repair work needed to be doing, or it's not as simple as just picking them up and recording? 
Yes. So there is a contingency put into that budget in the case that, for example, one thing that's very common with tapes that have been sitting for some time, um, again, um, you know, what the vendor will probably do in order to actually digitize the tapes, um, they will actually take the actual um, audio tape out of the case mm -hmm. um, and um, put it into onto a different, on a machine that will clean um, and then also digitize that tape. And right. after, after that digitization, um, they will most likely not put that tape back in the same into the same cassette. So they will put it in a new cassette um, that is actually also probably made of an inert plastic as opposed to the plastic that was you know, used in the 70s and 80s to house that those audio tapes. So that will happen. But I mean, we ha I have done a visual inspection of the cassettes. Mm -hmm. You know, they have been stored in the vault. It's not that they have not been cared for. Um, but um, again, you know, best practice is if you do have audio tapes like that, so for example, you should be doing a playback That's how you do it. on a regular basis. That has not taken place. Okay. Um, so again, most of them probably will be okay. Um, but I think there will be a... Um, um, no doubt, um, a, a small number of them um, that will need some repair um, and um, special care. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You, Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much. Tom. Thank you, Diane. Uh, yeah, Anka, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, proposal. I love, I love this project. Um, I, there are a couple of maybe clarifying things and maybe uh, uh, leading the applicant a little bit and, and Heather helped me here. Uh, but I would suggest that these cassettes are vessels in our uh, allowable spending purposes, building structures, vessels, and real property listed or eligible. And then it goes on um, as uh, determined by the uh, local historic preservation commission to be significant in the history, archeology, span culture, and architecture. Uh, and so, uh, if we consider these tapes vessels, and I would think then valuable, they need to be preserved, although they're being transcribed and, and digitized, um, that that would create the kind of eligibility, I think, for me. But I'm you know, trying, uh, trying to head some of that stuff off early to make sure you know, we, as a committee, we're thinking about the project in a consistent way so we don't get caught kind of way downstream. So uh, that's the way I, I think about you know, this proposal and, and these as kind of uh, historic vessels that um, if as Melissa would and the, um, the uh, Historic Preservation Committee would deem historically significant. Uh, I agree. Thank you, Tom. I mean, you always have your finger on the detail of uh, CPC funding uh, with an alacrity and insight that is awesome. So I just um, want to make sure that yeah we we set that the the groundwork yeah, yeah. And, and I had uh, one follow up Diane okay. and that is um, and I just to clarify and it's a follow up Diane on one of your questions that I understand phase one and thanks for clarifying the future of phase three but for phase two there are to your knowledge no other funding sources available. Are you asking me that question? Yes, please. Yes, at this moment um no i mean we just to give you a context um you know the the library and um the library corporation um th through COVID, we have um conducted various projects um and inventory projects and assessment projects and um during COVID, actually um the corporation mm -hmm. um funded a very significant project um we um did very similar to what we did with the tapes. Um, and based, that was partially based on the fact that Jesse Hopper, who um, is now a, a permanent employee of the library, um, has also specifically a background in museum studies and museum management. And so we inventoried all of the fine art that is also um, owned by, um, by the corporation as part of special collections. And we hired, um, and this is all funded by um, the corporation, um, we hired um, uh, Jim Coutre photography um, to come in during COVID 
to professionally photograph all of the artwork um, 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 of the um, collection. And um, that artwork is now part of this Omeka platform. And it, that is ready to go live. So that is actually mm -hmm. something we funded. And finally, um, and if you've been into the library lately, um, maybe you saw that they were missing, um, the corporation also funded um, the preservation, um, restoration and cleaning of all of our um, plaster busts in our collection. There are about 16 of them that were sent to Skylight Studios, which is in Woburn. Um, and um, those busts um, actually just returned yesterday um, and we're gonna have an unveiling of them and they will be um, reinstalled in the library. Um, so um, that was a major investment of, of the corporations funding towards um and of course you know my time and jesse's time um which again yeah. um so i i appreciate you adding that context because while other funding sources are not necessarily noted in the application you're creating that that larger context which helps us answer to you know the larger taxpayer constituents thank you yeah. you know you're welcome thank you tom so much um i just want to clarify that because we've just come in this is not a glass of wine. This is a glass of iced tea. <laughs> so in case you think I'm imbibing, <laughs> Heather, your turn. <laughs> Heather, I just wanted to provide a time check. Um, okay. We are 20 minutes behind schedule. Oh, thank you, Heather. I'm so sorry. No, that's not your fault, Anka. We've asked some, we've asked some um, complicated questions and you've answered them with such poise and such grace. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, are there other questions? from any of the people who are observing our, our discussions. I wanna thank Melissa for her additional commentary, incidentally. Are there any questions from those observing? Thank you very much. Then we go on to our next proposal, which is- Thank you. Thank, thank you again, um, Diane, and thank you to everybody for your consideration. I'm really grateful, thank you. Um, Heather, which is next? Um, I believe we have the Old Man's Exterior Preservation Project next. Thank you. And um, who is here to represent that? Could they raise their hand for us so we know who they are? Bob, is that you? And Michael, That's correct. Is that you? Michael and Bob, welcome both of you. Um, can you present this? We had a lovely visit to the, the old manse and thank you for the time you gave us and, and for an opportunity to, to see that a precious resource in Concord. So are you, are you gonna yes. start off, Bob? Okay. Yes, I will, please. Um, yes, thank you very much. We really appreciate this opportunity to come before the uh, committee and appreciate your time. Um, my name is Bob Murray. I am the um, project director for structures and landscapes for the trustees. And with me is Michael, Busek, who is our portfolio director for the Old Man's. Um, so the trustees is seeking uh, funding through uh, CPA for historic preservation work at the Old Man's um, to help preserve the integrity of the exterior envelope of the building. Um, I think many of you are quite familiar with the Old Man's, but it was uh, in 1966 uh, when it was designated as a National Historic Landmark and place on the National Register for Historic Places. So it is considered to be a cultural resource of national significance. The Old Manse is also a contributing feature of the Concord Historic District. Uh, the property was acquired by the trustees in 1939 and is subject to a historic preservation restriction held by the um, Mass Historic Commission. Um, much of the significance of the property is drawn from its um, associations uh, with American Revolution and Battle of Concord in 1775, as well as its uh, literary uh, revolution and the uh, transcendentalist movement in the uh, 19th century. The period of significance for the house really dates from 1770 to uh, 1900. And it's really quite remarkable for the house to uh, have that historic relevance over an entire more than a century. Uh, we've had a number of historic uh, structure reports that um, have been very helpful to us in, in terms of documenting the building's history, uh, its evolution, its current condition, as well as general recommendations and uh, preservation guidelines that 
um, has guided us um, in our work on the site. Uh, the first one was from uh, Bill Finch, an architectural historian. Um, and the second one was from Candace Jenkins, a preservation uh, consultant. Um, through uh, Candace's uh, report, um, she applied the secretary standards for um, criteria for evaluating uh, significance. Um, and she states this, the old manse possesses integrity of location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So uh, one of the things that's truly remarkable about the, the house is that so much of its historic fabric has survived intact after 250 year, years. Um, throughout its life, the building has never gone under uh, any significant renovation or modernization, or even through um, wholesale restoration efforts. So much of that original uh, material is still there and intact and is an important historic record. So our, our goals for the um, proposed project is really um, targeting the exterior envelope of the building, really focusing on the, uh, the siding, uh, trim, windows and doors um, and trying to preserve as much of that historic fabric as we can um, and protect it uh, from, from the elements. We consider the uh, exterior envelope to be sort of a critical system that when it is compromised can lead to active and progressive deterioration uh, that can um, have impact on a multiple of components leading to much more intrusive uh, damage. Um, actually, I apologize. I had meant to uh, share a screen. I will try. I'm not always successful with this, but if you'll bear with me. Well done, you did it. All right, thank you. <laughs> And, and so some of our, our key objectives for this project is really- Got uh, it, thank you. Is retention of historic fabric, uh, distinctive features and overall character of the building, stabilizing and consolidating and conserving historic features where possible. As a general overall approach to this is using the gentlest means possible. Um, targeting water infiltration as one of the main culprits, and then maintaining the protective coatings uh, to protect the wood from moisture and ultraviolet uh, damage. Uh, the Old Man's has uh, 35 windows, and it is one of the most vulnerable uh, components of the building system, and particularly the exterior envelope. Um, as I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of some of the troubles of um, Windows in generals, and certainly in a historic setting, uh, these um, 18th century sash. Um, so these are an area of, of concern for us. They are an area of active um, moisture penetration. Much of the um, glazing compound, the putty, has dried out, particularly those on the south elevation of the building. Um, so part of this project is to uh, do a comprehensive sort of reglazing of the um, of the window sashes to um, protect them from um, you know, further moisture uh, penetration. Um, in our historic structures report, our architectural historian, Bill Finch, has warned us uh, to be cautious though, that the um, old crown glass is an important artifact of the house and is particularly vulnerable. And he had cited some past efforts where with good intentions, uh, some of that fabric was lost. So he is recommending much, again, sort of taking the uh, most gent gentlest action forward uh, that is still effective, but uh, really uh, working on it in situ and uh, taking away loose uh, glazing compounds without being overly aggressive, uh, priming, reglazing, and then painting the sash. Um, also on the exterior envelope, um, much of the house is still the original uh, siding, the uh, ribbon pine siding with uh, sky joints 
Uh, but there are some areas, particularly on the uh, north elevation of the house, where that uh, original siding is compromised. It is no longer providing effect, an effective barrier uh, to the elements uh, and is making um, moisture penetration uh, possible. Again, our overall approach here is to um, not do wholesale replacement, but very limited replacement uh, where necessary. Again, our, our architectural historian has rec recommended uh, to match the material in kind uh, to get radial sawn uh, pine clapboards and then skive uh, the joints to match the, the lapping of the existing buildings. Most of the original material is in short lengths of about four feet in length. Uh, so we would uh, propose doing that as well and then securing with rosehead uh, nails. Um, so there's, again, sort of a limited amount of this, but um, there is areas where there's uh, the, the siding is, com is compromised and is allowing sort of uh, water to pen penetrate into the building. There are also problems with um, pests and uh, decay. Um, these, um, I apologize for the image here. These are two separate images here uh, on the screen. But one is on the rake board going up the uh, north side of the building um, where there's this sort of um, buildup of uh, moldings there uh, where there is rot as well as on the same side uh, where there's evidence of woodpecker damage that has gotten onto the holes. And again, sort of exposing um, or providing an avenue for water to penetrate the building. So in these areas, we would be looking to do some epoxy consolidation and repair of the uh, original fabric the best that we can. And, um, and then um, also look at, uh, I mean, our goal is to uh, keep that uh, original fabric by uh, consolidation. We're able to uh, leave that all intact and then patch in where necessary to avoid any further uh, moisture penetration. Um, some of the other areas of the windows are also vulnerable. Um, the window frames and sills, those mm -hmm. are frames are actually mortise into the sills and um, there are areas of rot. These would be other sort of examples of where epoxy consolidation getting a low viscosity, uh, two-part epoxy that would penetrate into the wood fibers um, and harden and then uh, apply a filler over that. Again, preserving original fabric um, to the greatest extent possible. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other uh, concerns is also the uh, growth of mildew uh, and um, moss on the building, which uh, begins to uh, break down the paint film as well as hold moisture up against the wood structure. We're looking at um, removing um, or cutting back, I should say, um, some of the vegetation around the house to allow for greater air movement. And uh, prior to painting, the building would uh, be sort of hand washed down uh, with um, a, a mild cleaner in bleach solution and then hose off to kill any uh, sort of active uh, mildew on, on the property. So in terms of painting, again, we're looking at the uh, gentlest approach possible. We're looking at uh, hand scraping and hand painting, no uh, power uh, equipment, and to minimize uh, any sort of impact to the um, fabric as, as we can. But we do want to ensure that it's prepped enough to ensure good adhesion uh, of a new paint paint layer, which is really sort of the first area of defense. So this is uh, showing some of the vegetation around the building that we're proposing to uh, reduce uh, significantly and allow for greater air circulation. Um, and this will also serve a purpose of um, making the, the building a little more visible uh, from the North Bridge and, and from the uh, Park Service uh, side of the property. So um, that's the extent of it that um, talks about our general scope and our approach. Uh, we think um, that you know the fabric is is one of the key uh, features of of the building. That the fact that it is remained intact 
Um, it is authentic and we will do our best to try to um, keep that as protected and in good condition for future generations. Uh, so thank you so much, Bob. I, I, I think it would be advantageous to have some of those um, um, photos attached to your application. Sure. Um, so that when um, people review this, they've got it right, right there in front of them. I think that would be terrifically helpful. Now we have, we have two specialists <laughs> who are following this project, Tom Kearns and Nancy Nelson. And I turn over the initial questions. Before I do so, Michael, do you have anything you wish to add? No, I, um, I think that this is a, a very important project um, for the old man's. We've obviously had a considerable investment in the exterior in terms of the landscaping in the last few years. And I'm feeling really great about the property as well as that the interior of the property, but I think this is the next step. Um, so we've spent a lot of time to put together this application. So we're, we're excited about it. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, Tom and Nancy, I don't know who's gonna go first, but take it away. Nancy, would you like to begin or I can? I was just going to give it to you. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, let me, uh, let me ask the first question. We could maybe go back and forth a little bit if we need to. Uh, so I think for the, our first evening meetings, the, our, our goal, I think my goal is to help our applicants create the best possible application. And so uh, what, and this uh, narrative is excellent. And obviously the building's a treasure. Uh, uh, undeniable. What I wanted to clarify is the building was last painted in 2010 on page two, so roughly 10 years ago. And so, what I, I'm going to, you know, uh, lead the witness here a little bit here. But um, uh, CPA funding is available for extraordinary remodeling, reconstruction, and repairs, not routine maintenance. So. Given the, the scope of the project that you are proposing and contemplating, I would suggest that this is a really significant moment for the structure, not a regular maintenance program that's happening every so many years, maybe every 10 years. And maybe the work that was done 10 years ago was not exactly equivalent to what you're proposing this time, but could you just give us a, a little bit of context there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, we are looking at, you know, areas that we are aware of uh, sort of uh, known deficiencies that we're trying to uh, stop and get out in front of. Um, as I said, you know, uh, broad deterioration can be progressive and we're trying to um, stop that from um, getting into the building and uh, expanding and require much more intrusive sort of work uh, at a later date. Um, the, the glazing of the windows is, is something that is um, very sort of tedious and, and time intensive. And I don't think uh, the last round really sort of put the, the, the time required to, to get a, a, a comprehensive, one would think that 10 years, uh, we wouldn't see wholesale fa failure like this. And so yeah, that's and, sort of a critical piece that we're hoping to address with this. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I just think that's significant uh, for, us to understand is that uh, in the, the kind of uh, life of this amazing structure, this is a really significant moment. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it's not part of a routine maintenance program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nancy. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add, I, uh, in addition to all the other accolades for the old manse, it is located within the national park as well. Yes. And um, the, the biggest well, the biggest comment I have on this application and the way that the methodology has been created is that I am so relieved to see the depth and breadth of your knowledge of historic structures and how to put them together, what the materials are, what the methods are. And it's rare to see, actually, and it gives me a great deal of confidence in what you're doing, and I can't wait to see it happen. Um, I did have one question. Yes. Um, I think I could guess at the answer, but why only one coat of paint? Well, we're trying to provide the pr protective layer uh, for the coating to, um, you know, to provide that level of protection, but um, there 
we've been very careful of not stripping away too much paint and there's quite a bit of historic material yeah. right down yeah. there. So yeah. we're not trying to add um, additional layers that are, are not ne necessary, but provide a comprehensive coating to provide the protection. And has the technology in, in paint improved um, in terms of its ability to provide that protective layer? Is it better? It has paint? the fact that the, the building, you know, as you know, is uh, a very porous building and has a lot of air and moisture traveling through it. Uh, and the paint, this most recent paint has lasted 10 years. It's just beginning to break down. You know, typically one would think uh, seven to eight years is, um, is how long you could expect that. Yeah. And then um, um, the removal of vegetation, I think all around the house, particularly um, that um, bridal veil or whatever it is in front of the of in front of the shed is yes. so damaging to the material behind it and the lilacs. I'm thinking the occupants would have uh, had those lilacs cut back so they could have seen out. Now it's a big wall. So really happy. It's gonna be better for the visitor, the house and, um, and it's great. So thank you very much. Um, it was really, really impressive. Great, thank you. Tom? Uh, Diane, quick follow-up. Uh, yeah, Bob, just a, a question about the uh, funding and estimates. Given the photos and uh, that you just shared with us and the scope you've contemplated, that carpentry contractor number of $5,000 and other funds, it just seems very lean. I'm not suggesting that you should be asking for more for CPA, but, uh, but uh, it seems like you'd maybe you want to have a contingency if your photos demonstrated maybe quite a bit of work there, but I'll, I'll leave you two of that. Thank you. Okay. I, um, we, we have gotten some initial uh, pricing uh, from for the work. So uh, we're fairly confident on that. We have reached out to a historic um, preservation carpenter um, for the um, wood epoxies and uh, particularly the um, the changing out of the clapboards which will be rather sensitive of uh, removing the old ones that are, are damaged without damaging uh, sort of adjoining ones there. Um, if there is unforeseen um, damage that uh, we come across, I, I think we would have the opportunity um, to get some contingency from um, sort of uh, from the trustees for um, emergency re repairs, um, depending on the nature and scope of it. Thank you. Uh, Tom and Nancy, other questions before we turn to committee members? No. Thank, thank you. you. All set. Okay, thank you so much. Peter? Peter, I think you're muted. Here we go. Thank you. I'll get the t-shirt. I know. <laughs> um, I have one question. <laughs> Yes. One question in the application, I may have overlooked it, but I see there's, um, can you let us, uh, or let us know what, what that other source of funding is? And maybe I overlooked that in the application. If so, I apologize. The other source of funding is the, um, our operating budget um, for the old man's is, is what we're uh, supplementing this, uh, as well as um, uh, time of staff, or we would be doing uh, the work of the vegetation removal um, as well as some of the administrative work. So that, that is a source of the, the additional funding, the other funding. Thank you. Peter, that was my question as well. Let me check to see if other committee members have a question before I pose mine. The trustees of reservations, Bob, I think has quite a bit of money, doesn't it? Um, it's a large you, organization. Right, I mean, have you turned to them at all for funding to help support this endeavor? Yes, and so that they are supporting it uh, through the operating budget. Um, the, the sort of a two sides <laughs> to a larger organization, you know, we now have 120 properties with 380 buildings. So there is a lot of competing needs uh, across the organization. Um, and we have um, just completed sort of uh, uh, condition assessments on all of our structures. Um, and we now realize that we have a substantial uh, deferred maintenance backlog. <laughs> um, but there are 
not surprising, but um, that's part of the realities. And, and so understanding that and being strategic of how we move forward. Uh, but there are an awful lot of competing needs. Um, and so, you know, there is money coming from the trustees um, through that operating budget um, for that um, contribution. I think we enhanced your application to indicate that because yeah. uh, for people who know the trustees of reservations and donate it to, are members of it and, and donate to it, um, yeah. I'm sure questions would emerge as to well, what about what about their capacity yeah. uh, to contribute to this, particularly given its significance as a national sure. park world. Thank you very much. Are there other questions that anyone has? Thank you both um, and, and Bob so much uh, for the professional detail and care that you're giving to this very important structure. And Michael, to our, to our community, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and your consideration. Okay. Yes, thank you for having us. Um, I, I believe that next on our list is 110 Walden Street. Am I right, Heather? May I just ask whether uh, uh, there's time for public comment on the Old Mats Project? I am so sorry. I meant to ask for that, Marcy. You're great to call me on that. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm Marcy Berkeley, uh, 41 Monument Street, and I've been chairing the local group of friends of local citizens who've been working pretty closely with trustees people um, in this uh, last chapter of the local stewardship group. We're really looking at are the projects, the undertakings, the details sort of consistent with the context, the role that the Old Mounts plays in Concord. And we feel really great about this one. It's very consistent with everything we want for the Old Mounts. Um, we are, just as Nancy said, really delighted that there's been excellent background work on the history. And another thing we're pleased with, it's an example of really good uh, cooperation, collaboration between the local citizens who were trying to, you know, be part of the family of the old manse and the trustees staff. Um, some of our members go back, you know, not just years, generations with the old manse, so provide this wonderful continuity. And actually, we've been worried for the last kind of year and a half, um, people as the old manse visitation went down during COVID, our members have been walking around and keeping an eye and we brought photos of some of the deterioration that we noticed without the expertise that somebody like Bob brings, but it was just obvious there was deterioration. We brought that to Michael's attention. He brought it to Bob, Bob came and looked. So it just, it really feels good to have this kind of collaboration together. Marcy, yeah. this is so helpful. If you could write a letter of support. I did, I did it. I think it didn't go through all the channels, but it will get to you. I actually yeah, made a few additional I, I, points. So yeah, that add, yeah. you know, and 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 if you if you don't know how to send it to Heather Gill, whose email is very public, um, if okay. not, just give me a call in the phone book, call me and we'll Perfect. figure out a way for you to get it to me and we'll make sure it gets yeah. into the report. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I think that kind of testimony is invaluable. And thank, you, yes. and thank you so much. And if you could list the members of your organization and what efforts they've made, this would be this would be very helpful. So thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. You'll end up with two letters and different number of points. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for calling me on my own my own error. So thank you. Um, all right, one ten Walden Street, and I see Anita Techley. Hello, Anita. Um, Good well, evening, and. Um, Anita Techley, I'm treasurer of the board of uh, Concord's Home for the Aged. And on the call also is our president, Kitsi Rothermel. Judy Walpole is our clerk. And um, Tom Bates is our vice president with principal responsibility for uh, capital projects. And um, so I'm going to introduce the, the project tonight and put it in some, into some context. Anita, Tom Bates was here, but I don't see him anymore. I'm, I'm here, but I can't get my beautiful picture on. Okay. So, so, his, <laughs> so you will hear him. Um, we, do, we did not bring slides tonight and um, we thought about it and um, we opted not to, but that's something that we could add if, um, if, you, if you think it would uh, help our application, we would certainly could supplement with, with that. Yeah, um, is it um, to yourself? Um, well, you, you did see us last last year, and, and that my role tonight is to kind of put this 
this is the fourth time we've come before you. And I wanted for, not all of you have been on the board for that whole time. And I wanted just to put it briefly into context. We first came to you in uh, the 2017 annual town meeting and you very nicely gave us a grant of $15,000, which paid for our historic structures report, which basically identified the projects that needed to be done on this home, which was um, built around 1850. It was originally in the Wheeler and Stowe families. It was acquired by Concord Home for the Aged, a nonprofit corporation, which was established in 1887, and it was acquired by them um, using a grant that we got um, $10,000 uh, at the time. And Kitsi will remember the name of the woman who gave the grant, but it was originally built as a home for, for women primarily. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the residents of the home could live uh, in an affordable homey setting, but they were, they were independent. Um, for many years, it was people could live the rest of their lives there. So there was some nursing home elements. Uh, that phased out in um, the 1950s where the nursing home um, component was no longer there. And we've been licensed as a lodging house since 1974. We have uh, uh, residents, we have up to seven residents. We have rooms into separate bedrooms, bathrooms for seven residents. We have an eighth bedroom for staff that stays overnight. We have one full-time staff member and four part-time staff members. We provide meals, room, board, house cleaning, and laundry for a nominal monthly rent. Not that nominal, but it's, it has remained the same for many years. It's about $2,000 a month. Um, but it's a homey setting, both indoors and outdoors, located very conveniently in on Walden Street, close within walking distance of downtown. And our residents do enjoy the the um, the location of the house, and you frequently see them walking around and um, enjoying downtown Concord. The um, so in 2017, we funded the historic structures report. That was completed in 2019. We came back to you in 2019 for um, funds for the architectural design and specifications and the documentation that we would need to implement the recommendations. And you gave us a grant of 20,800, which we supplemented a little bit with our own funds. That, um, that project was completed in the spring of 2021. We came back to you in 2021, which was last year, um, for the first of what we see as two um, larger phases for implementing the construction and the recommendations of the report. Phase three was what you funded partly last year, and we supplemented it with our with our own funds. Um, 185,000 came from CPC money. We and our contribution we thought was going to be around 44,000. As you all know, under COVID, construction prices and materials have dramatically increased this year. And our current estimate of our contribution will be around 167,000 for phase three. Um, we were lucky this past year, our investments have done pretty well and our investments do contribute over 200,000 for the operating costs just to maintain the, um, the existing, the maintenance and the staff and the food and supplies and all for the, the heat insurance and all of that for the home. So we're already subsidizing that. This past couple of years, we've been able to put money into the capitals, which is how we can afford, um, we feel it's important that we finish these the um, recommendations of the historic structures report within the next couple of years. Um, so that's phase three, where, which is we've started. Um, that was uh, to replace the roof, to replace the gutter system, um, to repair and um, all 62 of our historic windows, right. um, which is that alone is over 80,000 dollars for the windows and 
we are expecting to complete all those projects by June of, of this coming year. Okay. Phase four, which we, we really see as a continuation of phase three, and we've found historic contractors, Platt Construction, who's doing a, um, several of the projects for phase three, including removing the quite unsightly fire escape, um, <laughs> which was, was added in the uh, in I think 61 to replace a, an older wooden fire escape, but it's no longer required by code because we're fully um, sprinklered and we have three interior sets of stairs and we've, it's been determined we, we no longer need it. And we would really like to open up that side of the house just visually. Um, but we do have contractors we had a little difficulty lining them up um, but we do have some people and we would like phase four to, uh, which is Tom will go through, but that's mainly painting, um, as some asbestos removal and some masonry work, which I now will turn over to Tom. Yes. Uh, I apologize again for not having my picture up here. Um, I usually like to have my picture up there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but for some reason, I can't get it up. Um, so, yes, as uh, Anita said, we're, it's a continuation. And we're, uh, we've found a fair amount of uh, rot and stuff that we've got to take care of around um, the gutters and the, the replacement of the emergency doors with uh, replicated windows that match the uh, 1949, 1849 historic windows that we are currently restoring. Um, but moving on, we, when it's all done and we've re, uh, replaced all of those previous things, we do want to go into the uh, repairing the siding and exterior painting. We don't know exactly what we're going to find with the uh, 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 clabberds on the side of the house. We anticipate some uh, rotting and replacement around windows and possibly uh, in other places where they abut uh, trim, et cetera. But as it's a three-story building, we haven't gone up and, and, and checked each, uh, each area. And in, in fact, it looks in fairly good shape, which is actually why the, the amount that we're putting out for siding repair is relatively, um, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not overly, has doesn't have a large contingency on it. Um, the basement foundation, when we went in there with uh, Mr. Berquist to repair the piers in the basement and ask him about the foundation, he said that the original um, uh, limestone grout that's in there is long since gone away. And at some point soon, we need to uh, inject a newer uh, kind of grout that he uses um, but it's quite expensive because he's trying to get it back deep into the uh, stone foundation it's a field stone foundation um, that will then uh, you know solidify the foundation uh, as we go around to the uh, front stairs the granite stairs need alignment and repointing they're really not uh, currently safe or used much because they're irregular uh, rises. We want to straighten all those out. Uh, there is, as Nita pointed out, uh, asbestos in the basement that we'd like to get removed. And then finally, we have the front columns and uh, fascia that need to be repaired. They're quite sort of ugly right now. You'll see plywood at an angle that were used to prevent the birds from settling uh, there. Uh, and we wanna remove that and get mitigation to keep the birds out um, and still retain the, the beautiful look of the fascia and, the, and the, uh, the, whole, the whole house. And then when we do finally paint it, it will look like the gem that it, it needs to be. And we are also, as the previous caller was uh, talking about, removing um, and cutting back all of our trees that are on the east side of the facility um, 
so that uh, we don't have any moisture getting around there. We're per currently not too much moisture, but in any house in Concord at this time, there's moisture. Um, so that's, uh, that is what our phase um, four consists of. And that's why we're asking for uh, the money that we are. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your, your and Anita's help on our visit on Saturday. Um, Anita, we'll be hearing from anybody else from your committee right now? No? Uh, no, they're here if you have questions. And um, I just look up, looked up the name of the woman who, who gave the donation of $20,000 back in 1886 to acquire the, the house was Martha Hunt. Martha Hunt. Miss, Miss Martha Hunt. Miss Martha Hunt. <laughs> Don't you love it? <laughs> oh, ah, women. Uh, they, they, can, they can make remarkable contributions, and you are obviously an example. Tom, Tom yeah. and John are going to be covering this one. John's, John's watching a baseball game. We're going to continue to tease him. But, but Tom, uh, yeah. you're going to cover this one. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Diane. And I'll just let you know that John... Uh, did forward me a list of questions. And so I have those. So we, the two of us are coordinated. And so I can handle those. He said, I have a list of three questions for them. And then he went on to articulate maybe five to seven questions, but I think I'll do a little <laughs> bit of consolidation. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, this is the note. <laughs> This is the note from John. He says, I, he says, I have three questions for them. Do they have a contractor or contractors lined up for this work in whom they have confidence on pricing and competent work? First and the answer is yes, we have Platt Builders that is doing a, a large amount of the work. And we have David Burquist, who is the Mason, who I think everybody in town knows is one of the better Masons in town to handle our masonry. And Excellent. Tom, um, Thank the you. name of the, the um, window people, uh, the, um, do you remember them? The name of yes, Fish, Fish Call Windows. The Pish, they're reg yes, they're registered with the Window Restoring Association. I'm not sure the exact name of it. So we, uh, we actually do, thing. but that's already been in process and approved. So we do have written um, proposals, written contracts with. So we feel comfortable with the current yes. prices. Yeah, we, we we had a professional estimator. Um, uh, that we used to base our project prices last year. Um, and those prices were very low in, in historic, in, in retrospect, when we went out to look for, get some quotes, um, they were really were about half of what we needed. So, um, well, but we, we actually, we we're pretty comfortable with the numbers for this current well, proposal. Anita, that's a uh, thank you so much. And Tom, thank you so much. That's a perfect lead into uh, our second question, which is, uh, can they, you, the organization, handle any cost overruns as they had to do last year? So I guess this would be, I guess, is there a contingency if, in fact, there were cost overruns? We, we, we can. We, we would like, um, I mean, eventually we'd like to do some interior renovations. Um, and we've been doing little by little ourselves with some of the, some of our uh, resources. But um, yes, we, we, we're not signing a contract unless we feel comfortable that we could yeah. cover it in um, any <clears throat> overages. So. Yeah, great. You've had good experience working through that on phase three. Um, so, and then the third question here, do they have a sense of priorities among their seven named uh, projects? And then he goes on to say, what is urgent? What can wait if problems arise? So within your, and I saw a list of, uh, let's see what page this is on, but your detailed project budget, I think lists six projects. And I guess uh, maybe John is uh, asking, you know, if you needed to prioritize, do you have a priority list? Yes. Uh, we feel we want to uh, secure the uh, envelope of the building. So we would put repairing the siding, exterior painting. Um, and then we, the, all of the other, all the other parts of the project, the uh, foundation repair, the granite stair alignment, uh, the exterior foundation repair, the asbestos removal, and the front fascia and columns repair can all 
be put off. Of course, what we're always concerned about in the building of this age and so forth is um, that what we think is uh, can be put off all of a sudden becomes an urgent uh, repair. And uh, things like the granite stair and alignment and repointing, to me, even though we don't use them, um, it is still could be a hazard for somebody who decides to use it, especially in the winter, for example. Um, so that would be something that I would want to do. The same thing with asbestos repair, where it's pretty much okay in the basement. Most of it's covered right now, or all of it's covered. So it's not it's not a uh, present danger, but uh, uh, there is some question of having some of the pipes in the basement uh, redone because they're getting rotted, so to speak. And when you do that, you open up the asbestos. And once you do that, you might as well do the whole asbestos project. Right. So that's why yeah. these things are in phase four, but it's also what we can put off if need be. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, that, I think that's the end of his questions. I've consolidated those a bit. And there was just a comment he wrote that he wanted me to convey. He said, I've been impressed over the recent years with how they you have applied sequentially to CPC, used each grant as authorized and returned each year for their next needs. And he also says, I'm not bothered by their low number of residents as they provide much needed and affordable service here in well-to-do Concord. So uh, thank you, you've answered all of our questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, thank Diane. You. Thank you, Tom, so much. Um, other questions from the committee, um, Paul. Yeah, hi, Th thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a couple of clarifying questions on, on the financials, just uh, um, a clarification. So the, the budget you have here, the total budget for the projects that we just talked about is 206,000. And you're asking the um, CPC for 73% of that. Was that? that one, one, which would be 150. Right, which is in the proposal is 73% of that total. Right. Why 73% is that? Um, well, that's part one of my question. But what, what? Yeah, the 73% was calculated based on the 150. I guess we felt we could afford about 50,000. Um, and which is how, so we had, we just worked backwards to get the percentage, Paul. And so we asked for 150 and it, when we added up what we, um, the total project was 206. We, um, considering how much we're spending this current year, we, we didn't want to over commit ourselves um, for next year, but we felt we could spend. So it was, the percentage wasn't really the factor. It was the dollars. And it just right. came out okay. to about 73%. Okay. And, and the follow up question, and this is a purely hypothetical, although it may sound otherwise, if CPC funding was not available or less than the required amount was uh, mm -hmm. allocated, could the project and all those projects be um, conducted through your assets or other other ways? Um, we we would scale it back. We wouldn't do it all this this year. You know, as Tom just mentioned, the um, uh, you know the priority would be the we, we want to finish the the roof. We've got a contract for that, which is this year's project. We'll do that, and we, we would like to, with the same contract. We would like to proceed with the the paint and the um, uh, the work on the, um, the siding, but we would defer the rest. And basically we want to stay away from the principal as we use that for operating and also uh, uh, other, again, because of the age of the building, other things that it can arise. Um, for example, the rotting pipes, which were new. Um, so we, we we spent unexpectedly about fifteen thousand this year just on um, replacing some sewer and water pipe issues that came up around the holidays, um, and you know it's projects like that which is how we um, we want it. we don't want to get we don't want to hit the principal because we really need the principal to generate the money that we use to subsidize the operating costs. Um, we, in the past, had more principal. We took a pretty big hit in 2008 before any of us were on the board. Um, 
but um, you know, so we, we, we used to be able not just to, to subsidize our operating costs, but we were quite generous with grants to the community. And um, because, because we're a nonprofit, we're required under the attorney general's rules to spend at least 5% of our um, income every year on um, charitable works. And um, our costs were lower back back then and we were able to give well over a hundred thousand dollars um to the council on aging to the housing authority we, we funded a big chunk of peter bulkley renovations um police and fire department so we we weren't we have not been able to do, do that in recent years because we um because our principal is depleted right thank you and, and just last thing hearkening back to tom Kurz's earlier comment on the uh, the old man's um, the r routine maintenance versus preservation of the historical structure is that Tom do you think that's clear in, in this proposal or is there some refinement needed on that as well? Uh, if it's if it's for Tom Kearns, I yeah, I it's not Tom Kearns. That, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I've been lucky enough to kind of move over the last number of years with this uh, with this project, and I think they've done a, a really terrific job kind of creating a significant moment to, I think the, the, the building is 170 plus years old. Yeah. And I mean, our job, I think this is a moment to give it its next uh, what, 100 years. And uh, mm -hmm. it is, it's that kind of a, an investment, I think, in terms of some of these critical envelope and foundation systems. So yeah, I think they've done a, a great job with that. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Paul. I was hoping all. you wouldn't ask Paul, I was hoping you wouldn't ask when it was last painted because um, none of us uh, really know. Um, but it, you know, it hasn't it hasn't been hasn't been recent. So I can I can recommend a scientific study to take a sample to figure it out. But um, Tom Bates, um, unless you can answer that, but I um, no, I look I through I look through every all of our written reports and uh, there was no um, no mention of when it was last painted. So. But, you know, we're, we're starting from the top and working our way down. And, you know, so we, we want to do the roof, the gutters and right. windows, you know, and then do the painting. And all of this just adds up to so much money. And we want, we it, to look so beautiful. We want it to look beautiful in 2025. There you go. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anita, um, thank you so very much. And the other members of Kitsy and Julie who are here uh, supporting this, we really appreciate that. Um, are there any comments from people not on the committee? I'm um, meaning the CPC committee. Um, anybody who would like to add anything? Okay, thank you so very much. Um, so, that was terrific. Thank you for having us. And you know, Anita, I really, I always think the pictures help. I mean, because when they're online and, and people mm -hmm. in the site can look at them and, and it just reinforces what you're talking about. And so the so, degree that you can document that I think is, is we, always advantageous for any application. We, we will be happy to supplement our, our application with you know, some a little more narrative perhaps and, and um, uh, as well as pictures. I believe the historic structures report is is on there, but that's voluminous. So um, that's voluminous. So it'd be nice to just have something a little more succinct uh, yeah, for you. So. That just always helps. And in your narrative, you know, anything about the history of the, the generosity of the organization to the town can do nothing but enhance the application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank okay. you. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and so now we're on to Wright Tavern. And uh, I think I see Rosalind is here. And, and Rosalind, is there anyone else? I don't see anyone. Um, is there anyone else here who is going to help I see. present this? Or are, are, you, are, are you it? <laughs> I, I do apologize. I am flying solo tonight. Tom Wilson is in California. Peter Nobile is attending his father who's unwell. We've got three or four other people who uh, would like to be here and have other commitments. So this time it's just me, okay. but I, I do. And I apologize for that, but it is uh, no required. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't skipping somebody who was here to speak. No, no. And I, I uh, apologize on my own uh, to the committee. I will do my level best to answer questions, but if I end up, um, 
having to defer to one of the more expert members of the team. I apologize in advance for that. Um, and I do have a presentation. I forwarded some materials that Heather, I believe, was uh, quick to send along to you. And I have a presentation to share when, uh, when I'm ready. And it is so nice to see all of you again and to say hello to some of the new members. I'm not exactly sure who's new because I recognize so many faces from last year. But or Sarah and Paul are new and, 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 and uh, Charles, so there, none of the, those three have been yeah. um, in bed before and they've been terrific incidentally additions. So go ahead, Rosa, and if you could pop okay. this. Okay, and I, I have to say a special hi to Charlie who was my neighbor for many years. Hi, yeah, hi. I haven't seen you in hey. quite a while, Rosalind. It's been a while, very nice to see <laughs> you all. Um, Heather, are you ready for me? Yes, I've made you co-host, so you should be able to screen share. Great, thank you so very much. I'm gonna pop this over to presentation. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, terrific. Great, hi. So um, I wanna say in advance to the new members that parts, oh, sorry, parts of this presentation are duplicative to the presentation that we made last year at this time. This is a second proposal to the CPC. Um, for those of you who have already seen parts of this presentation, um, I hope that I won't bore you stiff and I'm gonna to try to go fairly quickly through this, but Heather will be able to forward this to all of you as well. So uh, this is a proposal, this year we are up applying to the CPC for a second round of funding, big number, 260,000. Um, and let me get started by just providing some context for those who don't know the Wright Tavern very well. This is a very old drawing of it from the 1700s. It's one of the oldest pre-revolutionary buildings in Concord. It's changed its look over the years, but this is more or less what it looks like now. In 1774, we don't know what color it was, although we understand it might've been yellow, uh, a popular color for churches and important buildings at the time back then. We're still researching this part. Um, this is from, uh, this is what it looked like when the British marched past it on the morning of April 19th in 7075. Um, before they occupied it. This is on their way to the uh, Old North Bridge. It is now a National Historic Landmark. Um, very pleased that this is on the register. And uh, the reason for this proposal is twofold. One is that the building itself is a very important part of Concord's history. And also as we prepare for the anniversary of the 250th anniversary of the revolution, the trustees of Hearst Parish in Concord um, felt that it was time to form a task force a number of years ago in preparation for this. And they created the Wright Tavern Futures Task Force, which is the group that presented last year to the CPC. And although most of the faces are familiar, we are now a new group and I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, the Wright Tavern Futures Task Force was um, charged with creating a vision for the future of the Wright Tavern. To and that group came up with this vision to reveal the Wright Tavern as a key location in the founding of our country so that it can finally take its rightful place in the history of Concord and our country. Um, some of you know that we learned to our embarrassment last year that in the normal historic maps of Concord, the Wright Tavern isn't even listed on the map, unlike many of the other fabulous properties around our town. The task force had a mission of developing partnerships to fulfill this vision um, with a plan aiming toward the 2024, 2025 for the anniversary. And the original members of this task force included um, names that I think are familiar to many of you here, especially because of last year, Tom Wilson, who is an active member now of the new group, Doug Baker, historian and his former sexton, both of First Parish and of the Wright Tavern, or Daner, the senior minister. Um, we have a new person, a facilities manager, Bruce Davidson, Philip Vanderwilden, 
who's the chair of the first parish trustees, which own owns the Wright Tavern. Me, I'm Rosalind Romberg, um, Laura and Mel Bernstein. Um, Mel is um, a well-known and respected historian of the tavern in town and then the treasurer for first parish. The, the task force generated five project teams to work on various aspects of research and development. And those teams created an initial project plan, which we presented to the CPC last year, that there would be a, basically a five-year plan with five gr distinct groups working on marketing and communication, funding and long-term financial planning for the tavern, Another group that was um, tasked with developing a network of interest in, um, interested organizations that might become supporters or ongoing um, funders or potential partners. The group uh, that met, that largely has um, presented to the CPC last year and will be the one most in contact with you this year, which is the Sustaining the Physical Structures group. That's the group that I chair, which is part of the reason I'm here. And then a group that is looking to long-term education and programming and partnerships with organizations, both within Concord, like the obvious ones, the Concord Museum, for example, um, and then the larger organizations like Minuteman National Park, uh, but also programming partners around, um, around the Commonwealth. We've had discussions with a number of other historic structures like um, the Paul Revere House and Old North Church and um, the First Parish Church in Roxbury where William Dawes set out on the one if by land, two if by sea. Uh, and then early stage discussions with other types of program partners in anticipation of the 250th. Think Philadelphia, New York, some of the um, or organizations located farther afield, but um, with whom we feel we could have solid programming relationships. The proposed timeline, which many of you saw last year, was that last year we would start the research and exploration part of the work, and then 2021 would be focused on reaching out, um, reaching out to funders, to programming partners, all the ones I mentioned, um, really still in an exploratory phase. 2022, coming up soon, uh, the programming teams are going to be working on finding partners, while the structural team is focused on um, planning for and then implementing next year the structural and engineering repairs that are needed to the physical building itself. It needs quite a bit of work, as I'll show you in a moment. In 2023, implementation of the programming and partnership and funding plans roll out with an idea that in the fall of 2024, we would be able to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the meetings around the Continental Congress. And then in April 19th, the actual 250th anniversary of the shot fired around the, heard around the world. So in 2020, the Wright Tavern Futures Task Force applied to the CPC for funds to start work on the structural engineering repairs. All of the other work that I mentioned there on the timeline and the other five groups is all pro bono. This is all volunteer. So the, there's no money being spent at all. Um, the, however, we knew that in order to be ready for 2024, we had to make some pretty significant upgrades to the building. Some the result of deferred maintenance, some largely just because of the age of the building. We initially said in our application last year that we thought the cost would be about $750,000. We were um, taking that number in part from sort of kind of wet finger to the wind estimates knowing the work we had to do, but also we'd had lengthy discussions with the folks over at Buckman's Tavern and work that was pretty comparable had cost, you know, close to $200,000 more, but they also did a number of things to the Buckman Tavern that we don't feel we need to do at our right tavern. So we applied initially for 500,000 to the CPC with the plan to raise the additional 250 for the structural engineering repairs from grants and from private individuals. All of this distinct from any fundraising around programming going forward. 
the CPC came back to us and recommended, and we think rightly uh, now, a phased approach, which is that we would have an application last year for one year of planning, um, meaning that we would do the historic preservation architect recommendation. We would create a preservation restriction. We would develop uh, engineering blueprints, architectural renderings, getting the contractor's estimates, which we knew we had all, we had had that in mind when we approached the CPC for the $500,000, but we had been thinking of it as a, as a one-time request for a two-year effort. Um, and this made, when we started working on it, we thought this made much more sense. So last year we came back to the CPC for 260 and we were delighted that the town at town meeting this funding was approved. And um, we have spent the first $178 of that money, <laughs> but the rest will be coming soon. Uh, and then the plan uh, for the current application is for the execution phase, meaning when we, we assume that we will actually start real engineering work late summer or early fall of 2022. It's gonna take a full year to get all of the um, construction estimates, the blueprints, the renderings, the measurements taken care of um, in large part because the building is so precious and we wanna take it very carefully. We wanna be very, um, we want to be very thoughtful, very clear. We don't want to make any mistakes. We don't want to rush it. So the planning phase, what we did last year while we were waiting to hear about the, uh, the town's decision was we started the background research. Uh, we thought that would make sense uh, to do research on other organizations and on other historic buildings, Buckman Tavern being one, but other taverns and other buildings where they might serve as models for the programming aspects and possible partnerships, but also where we could learn from the kinds of engineering and architectural repairs they had made over the years and maybe even learn if they'd made any mistakes. Uh, the task force also began exploring serious potential partnerships. We filed for 501c3 nonprofit status, which we shared with the CPC um, late spring when that was, or early summer when that was taken care of. We also, um, because the task force itself had ac actually completed its mission, it made sense to, uh, with the creation of the new nonprofit status that we create a different organizational and governance structure. Mm -hmm. And so we formed the Wright Tavern Legacy Trust and dissolved the Wright Tavern Futures Task Force. Um, and meanwhile, we were also laying groundwork for the planning phase. We met with the tenants in the tavern. We had meetings with members of First Parish. We met with um, the Historic District Commission, a number of other organizations around to get ready for the planning phase. So uh, for those of you who have seen these last year, this is just a refresher on what are we talking about when we're talking about repairs? Well, this, these are photos from the building inspection done on the tavern uh, in the summer of 19, 2019, and also from uh, the uh, structural engineer who took uh, photographs as he went. We've got sagging rafters, sagging girders. We've got cracks and uh, places where the walls are separating from each other. We've got sagging timber girders on uh, the second floor. We've got holes in the walls from past water damage. There's cracked or missing plaster in the attic. And I think most of you who saw this on Saturday got a, um, got a nice look <laughs> at how bad things can, you know, could be in there. We're hoping that it's not awful, but we do know that there's evidence of framing failure. We've got bowing. Um, uh, these are all in the upstairs. And then downstairs, um, joists that have no bearing, framing, and um, sections where lally columns are either not attached to the floor or not attached to the ceiling, uh, to the rafters, where they, you know, to the, to, to the boards are supposed to be holding up. The fieldstone wall is not in very good condition. We've got spalling. And then on the exterior, there are sections where we've got cracks in foundation or damaged brick. 
So, uh, and some things you can even see like the sagging on the Northeast corner there. So um, this is an important building. We love this building. This has been a part of our history for so long that it makes sense to repair it. So what have we done? Where are we now, basically? We have drafted the preservation restriction for the tavern, which you should all have copies of right now. Um, in anticipation of the, of the kickoff of the planning phase, we have engaged the two historic preservation architects, Larry Sorley, who was the historic preservation architect for the Thoreau birthplace, among many other places around Concord and other parts of New England, and Stephen Mallory, who was the author of the Historic Structures Report for the Wright Tavern, which the CPC generously funded back a number of years ago. Um, he is now the head of historic architecture, preservation and properties for the uh, Peabody Essex Museum and is uh, deeply involved in all the work going on all around New England uh, around uh, preparation for the 250th anniversary. Um, they, I've met with both of them in the last two weeks and they are planning to start work next week on build on drafting their recommendations, which they will do um, initially on site at the Wright Tavern. They're gonna be coming through and touring with the structural engineer, possibly next week or the week after. The holiday week is a little iffy right now, but um, kicking off in October, it's happening. The structural engineering team is Brian Walsh, uh, well known around Concord and around New England. And the architectural team is Nishotic Architects, residents in the tavern and longstanding, uh, longstanding archi uh, architects with so much ex experience around historic properties. And um, that team, Josh Bath and members of that team are going to serve as the architectural project managers of the effort. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I cut off one port piece. We've added something since our application last year, which is that we've engaged a um, historic landscape restoration experts. They will not only help us with repairs to the exterior grounds after the work is done, but also with programming around how the exterior of the tavern would have uh, been used at the time of the revolution. It, as a quick example, they noted that at that time in history, any tavern around New England would have certainly had chickens, wash yards, stables, possibly, you know, certainly outhouses. They might have had laundry areas. They might have had dishwashing areas outside. And while we're not planning on bringing a chicken yard in the backyard there, we are thinking that there might be some very interesting educational opportunities to do programming of different kinds there, possibly with video or more. Um, artifacts or something like that. So um, so the, our planning phase is actually uh, underway now. So in September, we had the tenants remove the items uh, that they had stored in the attic in the basement. And I think you probably would have noted on your tour that they were closer to empty. They're not quite done, but they're almost done. And um, we inventoried the artifacts that were in the, art, uh, in the basement and the attic belonging to the right tavern itself. That's in preparation for moving anything that might be delicate or wrapping and preserving anything that needs to be taken care of. Uh, now, October through the, through the end of this year, the historic preservation architects, as I mentioned, are gonna be developing their recommendations for the engineers and architects. The engineering team, they actually start tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. I'm meeting them there at eight and they're gonna start measurements photographs of both the interior and the exterior. And then their focus is on um, preparing the initial proposals for exploratory demolition. So this is the minimal, the, the, what they are going to propose is the minimal amount of demolition of the existing fabric so that they can get um, accurate photographs and accurate measurements of the work that needs to be done particularly the rafters that are behind walls and such. Um, and the historic landscape restoration folks are going to start more detailed restoration on what can be known about both the Wright Tavern and comparable properties around New England so that they can be thinking about what would make most sense for landscape restoration after the work. In the winter and the spring, 
uh, the engineering team will do the demolition they need, develop their engineering drawings, and prepare the scope for the repairs and estimates so that contractors can do those estimates. And the architectural team will be producing its architectural renderings and the scope. Um, I should say that our um, the, the legacy trust, our team, um, intends to forward all of these documents to the CPC and make sure that you have a complete library of the documents as they are produced. Um, so we, we've said before, we really believe in transparency here. We also really believe in reaching out to as many people who are experts as possible here to provide help and guidance in this. So uh, as fast as we get them, you'll get them too. And, I, and um, you know, we hope that you will bring us any concerns or questions that you have for us to give back to the teams, the architectural teams and engineering teams and the restoration teams. We, we expect that by late spring, and early summer latest, we should have contractor estimates in, bids for the work, and a proposal for the restoration of the landscape. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the last several things I wanted to share with you, and you've already heard a bit of this tonight already. Um, boy, we've had a cup, we've had some sticker shock. Uh, we've been told already by uh, both Brian Walsh and Stephen Mallory today said, uh, structural engineering repairs and architectural repairs, supply chain issues have driven the prices way sky high. We earlier said to all of you, we thought the repairs were going to cost $750,000. we are guessing right now it's going to be more like a million one, a million two, a million three. We're making plans on our own for that. Um, but uh, and we are also hoping that because our construction won't start for another year, that maybe some of those supply chain issues will have worked their way out. We do have the luxury of having this full year to do the plan. We're not breaking ground for a while. So we have come back to you for the, um, we have applied now for the funding for what will be the construction phase for next year. Um, but we're also in early, early stage discussions with just a, over, well, close to two dozen granting organizations and private individuals. Um, we've been very active at um, starting the rumor mill, as it were, with, with um, individuals that we know care about historic buildings and care about the revolution um, and the, uh, the founding of American democracy. And we've also uh, started discussions with a number of Massachusetts based and New England based um, organizations that give grants for, um, for these kinds of projects. I, I can share with you right now that it looks like there, will, there are many more opportunities for grants that we can apply for, for things like programming, education, uh, technology upgrades, uh, which right now would be premature for us to apply for because we do not have a programming plan yet for how the right tavern will be used. We have a team working on it, but they're very much exploratory. Um, but but there's, a, there's a lot of interest out there and, and we're very excited about some of the early conversations that have been very exciting. So a couple of other updates. Um, we were approached by Ken Burns production team. Uh, Ken Burns is doing a something, a mini, ser mini series or a film on the American Revolution and has already been scouting out the um, Old North Bridge and Minutemen National Park. And sure enough, they found us. We've had several very good conversations with the team. We forwarded them a lot of the same material that we forwarded to all of you, the background material on the history of the tavern and uh, what we're doing. And so um, we're keeping our fingers crossed. We'd love to be on television. I think that'd be awesome to have that, uh, to have the right tavern be in a Ken Burns production would be great. Um, I mentioned that we've started conversations about partnering. We also on the Legacy Trust board, we have members who are involved in the town of Concord's planning for tourism and for activities around the celebrations. Uh, coming up in a few years. Um, another thing we did, I was so happy to see Anka Voss on this uh, 
on this call a little earlier. Over the course of the summer, we identified uh, all of the documents relating to the tavern that were being stored at First Parish and uh, gathered them all together, organized them, and then scanned them all. Um, and they're now all in digital format. And we had a, dis we had a meeting with Anka Voss and we are preparing to transfer to her all of the paper documents and our scans so that they can compare them to their scans that they will make with a different kind of scanner, more professional. Uh, Thank you. Different, a different initiative. Um, some of you might know that First Parish launched a year ago a group called Greening the Campus, a research task force that is looking into ways to um, take the First Parish Meeting House, the small co so-called cottages, the small properties that wrap around the campus and the right tavern uh, as an adjunct. That's not their primary focus at all, uh, but to um, explore insulating all of those uh, buildings and exploring heat source alternatives to fossil fuels. And um, the insulation, of the meeting house has gone forward and the first of the cottages is insulated and the next uh, cottage is gonna be insulated within the next month. And as the first parish bringing the campus team has gone forward, we've partnered with them to learn from them and to have their, um, the companies that are coming in and working with these other very old buildings uh, explore the possibility of insulating the tavern as well, which would also help the structural integrity of the building and the long-term sustainability. And we are staying in this liaison role as the Greening the Campus group looks at heat source alternatives as well. So we might have something interesting to tell you all in a couple of months about that. We also made a decision to engage a museum design consultant to help us as we think about long-term planning. Uh, and that is a place where we would welcome some help and recommendations. We don't, we don't have that one nailed yet. Uh, so that's basically it. Thank you so much for the support last year and for the success of the town meeting in the summertime. We were, we were really bowled over and we're very excited about the work going forward. And we hope you will continue to support this extraordinary effort. Uh, and now I will do my level best to answer your questions. <laughs> Rosalind, thank you so much. Uh, Nancy Nelson and I are covering this project. <laughs> of course, and it was so great working with you last year. That was just, that was a real treat for me. I loved it. So we decided to team up and, and do this again. Um, one of the things, I mean, I found this presentation extraordinarily instructive to say that you've only spent $158 I mean, really, it wasn't 158000 but it was $158 so far. I kept yeah. looking at the proposal as it existed and thinking, where, what happened to the $260,000? Where is it? Where is it gone? And what's it doing? Um, and, and so I think, It starts tomorrow morning. The bill, the right, meter okay. starts running tomorrow morning. <laughs> well, so I think that anything you can do to um, make that clear in the pr presentation yeah. in the proposal, um, the, the timeline that you presented in this proposal was edifying and clarifying um, right. in, in a way that the other proposal, at least to my view and my, and I read it many times, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a little more, a little more confusing. So, I mean, I, it, you know, this wonderful material in it, but I think that <clears throat> particular presentation is, is very helpful. So the more you can put dollar signs next to those and demonstrate the way in which the resources that you already have are being used um, would, would help, I think, with us going forward in terms of any funding. Um, right. I'm sure you understand that, but I'm just, you know. Totally. And you were all so patient with us last year because we knew we were flying blind. We had no dollar figures from anybody and there was no one willing to tell us what they thought things were gonna cost. They just, uh, right. you know, everybody we met with. What we do think is that as every month passes and we start to receive the invoices from the planning phase, you know, we're gonna, we'll submit all of those to you anyway, but you'll start to see what the structural engineers plans and measurements with the architectural renderings are costing on a, I'm assuming it's gonna come in on a monthly or a quarterly basis. 
Um, and then our hope is that we will actually have contractor estimates for the application that we just submitted that we're talking about now, that we will have contractor estimates maybe starting as early as March, April, May, so that before town meeting, we'll actually know what the money, what, what this tranche is going to be assigned to. Okay, but because but, for instance, I've not seen the preservation restriction document. Now you said we oh, should I, have it. I don't know uh, if he did some- Just came of, today. Oh, he it emailed did. it to today. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I've been in. I've, I've not been here, so I mean, I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, mm -hmm. oh, right, right. But I'm, I'm glad it's here. Yeah, okay. it's our first. It's a draft, and so we are. It's being being reviewed right now. And our feeling was that we wanted you all to review it as well because you've you've done this. You know, we have a we have the lawyer drafted it, and we have other experts uh, expert eyes looking at it. But we also thought it'd be nice if you looked at it too before we finalize. Yes, it. I look forward to looking at. It. I'm sorry to be behind on that particular <laughs> document. I didn't realize. Not to worry. Not okay. to worry. Nancy Nelson. Well, Rosalind, that was quite a presentation. And my head is swimming with the possibilities and going all different directions right now. So I want to bring us back to the Wright Tavern and the first phase of funding. And some of, I went back to your December 7th letter where, you know, sort of the reduced outline of the scope was presented. Yep. and tried to match it up with, with the current phase one. And there are so many things in the phase one um, on page one um, that said CPC reviewed and the town of Concord agreed to spend $260,000 on the following projects or elements. And mm -hmm. so many of things, so many of those things are not really part of the grant agreement. And I was wondering if you could help us um, understand how this how this worked, like the landscaping, I don't think we ever thought of or discussed, but it's an item in here. So I was trying to match this page one, phase one description with the budget description later where they're talking, where you're talking about phase one and phase two, but um, they're not really broken out. They're not really broken out. So I can't, I can't really understand what, what you intend to fund with the $260,000 per the grant agreement and what you're really requesting now, because it seems like you're requesting some things that we already think we funded. Ah, so sorry about that confusion then. And, and <laughs> right. um, maybe just me. But oh no, I mean, that's I'm what I was saying. Confused. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're let me see if I can try. Uh, I will tell you what uh, what we are aiming to do and if we've been inarticulate I, uh, I I can only blame the fact that we are it's a moving target and things are evolving as we learn. Yeah. So when we when we applied last fall for funds for this fall to start now, which yeah. is just starting now. Yeah. Um, at, when, once the CPC suggested that we cut the amount in half, we well, we asked for we asked for you to tell us what were the most important structural repairs for the building instead of you know yes. doing the doing the recarpeting and the repainting and and other things that were not really structurally necessary. Right. So how we how what we learned over the course of the winter and the spring was that we that there we that we needed to have a very thoughtful planning phase that included all the architectural renderings the development of the blueprints all the measurements the very careful preservation of the historic fabric um, so minimal demolition uh, historic architect recommendations for all of that work, all of that work to start September to October of 2021. And that is basically the work that is starting right now. The, um, our hope is that we actually won't, that that won't cost $260,000 
because when we wrote the grant application to you all, we weren't entirely sure what was gonna be involved in these structural engineering repairs. We believe that um, if the engineer and the, if the engineers and the architects and the preservation architects and all the team working on the building works faster on developing all these renderings and blueprints, which we have been told could take from, set, from October until March or April or May, our hope would be that we would have contractor estimates before June for what the work would actually take. Um, in which case we would be able to start work, if we could, to start work in the summer of 2022, we would, but conservatively, we're not certain we can do that. So, so there's been no, virtually no collaboration among the historical architects, the architectural conservator, the engineers. At this point, they've really not looked at the building yet, right? The exploratory has not happened. And so they don't know any more now than you guys did they, last year. Mm, none of them had looked at any of the building prior to the application of last fall. The application last no, fall right. was to bring them in, right? Right. right, right. So they, they, all of those different experts came into the building. I think I did my first tour with them in February or March, and then April yeah. they came back multiple times. So they've all met with each other multiple, multiple times and multiple done detailed times. tours all together multiple times. Uh, sometimes in pairs, sometimes in triplets, but yes, um, yes. Uh, However, at no time in there were they doing any chargeable work. They were just looking, and I'm trying to use the right language here because I'm not an architect or a contractor myself. They were um, not charging us for their time. They were coming to, to talk with Tom Wilson, me, the team that was, <laughs> that had applied to you for the planning phase for this and to do the work, which we looked on as a two to two year project. And they were helping us, in part, they were helping us ask the right questions and answer many of your questions, which was a hugely helpful process. But they weren't, we, but we haven't received it. We hadn't received an invoice from any of them yet because they hadn't done any work. We all agreed as a group that we didn't want to start the process of um, billable hours with any of them until we knew whether the town felt that this was a worthwhile, or the CPC and the town felt that this was a worthwhile effort. Um, in part, our, I can tell you that in part, our fear as a team was that if the funds were not approved, we knew we would have to go out for a very large grant. We would probably go out for a multi-million dollar grant. And if that was gonna take several years, we didn't feel it would be fiscally responsible for the trustees of the Wright Tavern to have already racked up 30 or 50 or $70,000 in expenses on engineers and architects for work that we might not be able to do for four, three or four years. So we waited in town, until town meeting, which had it been in April, we might've gotten started earlier, but because it was in the summer, we, we had to wait. We had to wait, we had to wait. So we did all the other stuff that we could do that was free. We met with the historic landscape restoration people. We talked to museums, we talked to granting organizations, we talked to potential partners and stuff like that. Once we got the commitment from the town uh, and the grant agreement that went with it, we contacted Stephen Mallory, Larry Sorley, Brian Walsh, Josh Bath, we contacted a lot of different individuals and said, it's the beginning of August, we're, well, we're getting ready to start, what would you like to do? And um, August was a dead month for most of them or they were committed on other projects. Brian said that he could come in for the first time in October, Josh Bath started doing floor plans, that's the $178 we got charged. Um, and so we basically spent, I spent September, uh, but a, the team of us spent 
um, organizing and pro project management, putting together a project plan for what kicks off uh, this week on the structural part. And meanwhile, things like working with the lawyer on the preservation restriction, yeah. which was yeah. a big time sink. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and talking to people in like on Nantucket, you know, talking to all the different people who've done preservation restrictions before, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, meet, meet, meetings with Stephen Mallory, meetings with Larry Sorley, um, uh, a lot, there are, I would say that August, Ju middle of July through um, this afternoon, <laughs> Peter Nobile, uh, who I believe most of you know from the F Historic District Commission, who is an experienced historic architect and who is on the board of the Wright Tavern Legacy Trust. He's and I, is he a historical architect actually? I don't, I, don't, know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know his bona fides. I know that uh -huh. he cares very deeply about historic structures. Oh, okay. And has been going, he has done at least some work on those, but we've had a lot of gotcha. meetings with people like them and also with, you know, like insulating companies and with, it's been a lot of information gathering August, September. And then, um, and, uh, and basically now we're ready to pull a ripcord and get, get going or, that's the wrong analogy, but you know what I mean, to get started. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. parachuting, is now. <laughs> parachuting, parachuting is the wrong analogy, right? Uh, you, and Nancy, the other, the other thing I should say, Nancy, is that, that it took uh, quite a bit of time and some effort and some money on the part of the trustees to set up the 501c3 yeah, and yeah. You know, organize the, the financial procedures for handling the... Um, the right so the right tavern futures task force never handled money and the right tavern legacy task force now <laughs> yeah. has to handle money yeah. Yeah. including you know grant applications yeah. and so we've been doing research into grant applications and in granting foundations and yeah. more of that so um if if that makes it look like we haven't been going by the letter of the agreement in part it's because there are a lot of moving parts here well i just mostly i wondered if there's any way you can clarify what the money that was given for the structural repairs on the first go round, how that relates to what you're asking for this time. And sure. help me out architects out yep. there, Tom. <laughs> what, how yeah. could that be, how could that be clearer in terms of what the money's going for? I, mean, it, I think, I think we all thought that it was gonna be used in a different way by now and you're yeah, that's the reason i think your presentation has clarified things at least uh -oh. in, in some important ways as has your response to nancy um are there other questions from are there questions from the committee or clarifying comments from the committee um Tom? well i i guess yeah diane I, I yeah nancy thanks for exploring this area i i'm <laughs> Looking through the, our files on the, you know, the, the, um, let's say the refinements you made to your application last year, uh, Rosalind, which was excellent, and just see if we can, uh, maybe between this and next meetings, we can we can just kind of put those pieces together and just make sure we understand. You know, uh, we we did this very successfully last year in yeah. terms of just working together to make sure there, you know, as questions come up or clarifications are needed, we we kind of figure that out because, you know, I understand, Nancy, that you we've got to get the uh, scope of the accounting in the fiscal years <laughs> to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, gotta... I will share with all of you because you because you were so generous last year in and patient with us as we were iterating on the on the proposal that um, Two days ago, I said to Tom Wilson, when I knew he was going to be out in California and couldn't attend, I said, you know, Tom, we're going to get caught flat footed around the money. And he laughed and we were like, because what we could have done was quietly taken this whole year to spend the last spend the money that was approved in the summer. And what you would get is, and we spent this much on the architects and this much on the this and that much on the that. And look at what, look at how your money was used. It was beautiful. I was envying several of the people earlier tonight who were able to do that. And instead it was like, oh my God, there's a September deadline for the next application for the money we need for next year. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? We can't say, we have no idea. So yeah, I do well, apologize the, in, to in, all of you for that. 
last year's supplement, which I have in front of me from December 7th, 2020, it has $20,000 of consultation services and then items two through nine, well, number nine is contingency, but two through eight are specific construction implementation that's right. pieces of scope. Yeah. So right. I, I guess that's maybe the work we should do to right. clarify. And, you know, as we said, make applications the very best they can be. You know, yeah. I don't know, Nancy, yeah. if I'm maybe generalizing too much, but I, I you know, I see new alley columns, new, you know, um, crumbling chimney, those those scope items, and you know that I think we want to try to put t- taxpayer dollars in in make them active as soon as we can, and not have those get banked, um, you know, um, for some later date. So I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe okay. that's we that's agree with, we agree with that, you. I mean, yeah, that a- may be an area yeah. that we that could get some clarification as we move forward. It's a kind of cognitive disconnect between what we thought was happening and what happened. And, and therefore, you know, the clarity around that is going to be really, it's really important. And any way we can help you with that, I think would be, yeah. you know, yeah. would be valuable. Great. Uh, yes, Charles. Rosalind, um, I, I hope I'm not, not to uh, muddy the waters any further, but, but um, I, I was, um, uh, when, when we did the site tour uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, it wasn't clear. Um, I'm just curious if you can say anything about, we went through the interior and the interior looked um, kind of really cut up and so forth. Uh, I wasn't really sure what I was seeing. Um, Mm -hmm. And um, uh, after all of the construction work is done uh, that, that, that you've talked about for the next phase, this, this, you know, phase that you're now starting and the next phase, um, will there be interior reconfigurations that will that will require more construction um we let me see i'm, I'm going to see if i can answer that in a way that makes most sense we expect t- several things one is that the structural in it structural engineering repairs that need to be made to the building in order to ensure that it will be here 100 or 200 or 300 years from now unfortunately have the characteristic that when that work is done, if you didn't know they'd been done, you wouldn't know they'd been done. It's almost entirely underground, in the basement, behind the walls, up above the ceiling, in the attic. Um, The good news is once the scaffolding comes down that's just holding the building up while the work's done, the exterior shouldn't be touched at all from a historic perspective that way. The bad news is the interior, the the first floor certainly, which has the most historic elements to it, the the beautiful tap room and and the fireplace room and things like that. um, We don't expect we're gonna do much more than vacuum those rooms when this work is done. They're not gonna be touched, the first floor, not gonna be touched. The second floor, the ceiling has to come down um, in order for the I-beams to go in to support the structure, but then the ceilings can go right back up exactly the way they are. Um, There's no obvious reason to change the, uh, the layout of the second floor unless as we're doing the work, as I've been told anyway, if we discover original elements, like they take down the ceiling and they discover there was a, another door in a different location or a window in a different location, then the historic preservation architects come in and say, we recommend this gets restored or we recommend, I don't know what they recommend. Uh, this is gonna be an exploratory process. The, the questions about the third floor and the basement are exactly what the next three months should um, should expose. We believe that the third that the attic area where that you would have seen, we believe that the attic with all those little squirrely rooms at one point was just an open attic. And at the time of the revolution, it's pretty reasonable to think that it might have just been a big open space with a lot of hay on the floor for people to sleep on, you know, something like that. We we don't know, but we'll find out as we get in there if 
if it makes sense to take all those swirly rooms out because that makes it more authentic. And if that's what the historic preservation architects recommend, then that would be something we would it, we would find out whether that's the right thing to do. Um, in the basement, if as they're working with the field stone walls, if they find a section of foundation and say, oh, there was a room here where we don't see one right now and they say we should restore it. These are, these are all things that we're gonna be sharing with you and say, guess what we've learned this month. Um, so we don't know the answers to that. The, um, I don't know if that's the answer to your question, Charlie, but that's what, that's sort of where we are right now. Yeah, yeah, a, total, a, yeah, a totally separate issue is the first floor and that's not part of these applications at all. That's really exciting. I look forward to hearing what you find. <laughs> Uh, Nancy, you and then we'll go to Tom Kearns. Yeah, Nancy, muted, Nancy. You're muted. Nancy, we can't hear you. Muted. I know, I know, I know. I'm getting there. I'm getting <laughs> so there. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to remind everybody that the attic is one of the most historic places in the building now. The rooms that are up there that make funny little rooms and look odd to us were done, I think, it, it's in the historic structures report, I think, that these, that, that happened in the 1820s. And mm -hmm. while it's not 1775 or before, that doesn't make it non-historic and it doesn't make it unworthy of the gentlest possible treatment. And the same with the ceilings that are sort of old and plastery. And, instead of having to tear them down, the reason you have historical architects with you is so they can tell you how you can pin them back up and you don't have to remove historic fabric. So that's why right. I keep asking you about the engagement of historic architects and Stephen Mallory, the architectural conservator. And I'll, that's all I'll say, thank you. Thanks, yeah. Rosalind. Thanks very much for your patience and all this. Oh, it's, it's great. It's really great working with people like you, Nancy. It really is. It's <laughs> just, we, we know, Thank you. I can't tell you how much more confident I feel as somebody who is neither a historian nor an architect. I feel so much more confident that this is going to be done right because we have people like you all who are experts on things that most of us on the team know nothing about. Well, having Nancy and Tom here makes a big difference. Tom? Uh, uh, thanks, Diane. Uh, Rosalind, I, I just wanted to go back to the uh, letter of uh, December 7th of 2020 only to help around some of the clarification that we might work on. And mm -hmm. in that letter, it stated that our concern is that if we wait until the next cycle of CPC consideration, the right tavern may be at further risk to unforeseen events. Um, and then it goes on to describe that so that that said to me that between let's say between the funding in, of this July and, and next July, for example, that there's certain action that you would want to be taking, and I think we we recommended the grant based on these really critical issues, and I think they're even noted as critical, and so things change, and I understand that maybe experts come in now they do a, a deeper look at things and and your approach to this might evolve but i think that would be really good to understand uh in the greater context of this now you know this next uh application as well and if things have evolved and heather, heather heather you could be the more proper guide here it might evolve the available funding of last year's sure. approval Right, sure. and that would be returned, and it would be reset. And I don't know if it can just if it can just morph into different kinds of scope and different kinds of approaches. But I think that's what we would want to be careful of. Yeah. You know, so that's Heather, good. did I did I say that appropriately, Heather? Yeah. So the funding last year was very specific for what it can be used for. Um, so, say the the exploratory work you know, shows mm -hmm. that you don't need something done. You can't use that funding for something else instead. Oh yeah, no, 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 we, we understand that. Yeah, yeah, we do understand that. Yeah, I, I also, Tom, I should say one more thing, which is that um, w the letter of December, 2020 um, prompted us to bring 
uh, to invite Larry Sorley and Stephen Mallory and Brian Walsh and others. Um, and in fact, I think Diane and Nancy, you even came on a number of visits in the spring, well past that fun. December letter where we, um, you know, we were climbing up ladders into the looking at rafters sure. and things like that. And that uh, uh, the vote, I think. it yeah. was before the vote, exactly. It, and it, and part of what we wanted to understand was whether there were any critical issues that we needed to address, and we would just have to deal with it financially. We didn't have the funds to do it, yeah. but we were like, you know, if this if there's trouble, we want to know. And I uh, completely agree with you. I don't, I don't claim to have access to exactly the right documents, but I just think this this area of clarification will be helpful. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And and and, and important for just the accounting purposes, yeah. so that if in fact yes. you know you didn't spend the two hundred and sixty thousand dollars, but you only spent sixty one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, then you have to return a hundred thousand dollars, which we can then, uh, you know forward to our consider forwarding to the the ongoing private i mean that kind of accounting is is important and very and i agree thing is we read, <laughs> we read through things so it's a big undertaking it's a critical project for the town it is central to the history and the character of the town and the vitality of the of the 250th so in any way that we can um work together uh to help right. and Given the outreach that you've made to grants and proposals and and expertise and the grace with which you handled our many concerns last year, is much appreciated, Rosalind. Oh, and we were so grateful. You you were you were great to work with last year. I thought. Well, are there other questions from the committee? Are there questions? I'm going to do it this time. Are there questions from anybody <laughs> <laughs> who is observing what we're doing? <laughs> um, seeing no hands raised or, or no commentary. Uh, thank you so much, Rosalind. And we will we'll, we'll continue to work with you and figure out how to make this as, as, as sensible as we can, okay? Thank you. And I, I wanna say a special thank you. thank you to Anka. If she's still here, I see her name is there. Yeah. There's a square with her name on it. Yeah. Anka, yes, Anka I'm still here. I, <laughs> and I, I, I apologize. I called you out telling you that we had done the documents and after our meeting in the spring and you didn't know you were going to be called out tonight. So. <laughs> that no, was great. It's, it's Thank great you all. Thank great. you all. It's a pleasure Thank to work with you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Heather, again, because I, we, I didn't have access to a printer and things fell apart today, um, can you tell us what's next on the agenda, please? <laughs> so we just have draft minutes left to review. Okay. Did everybody have a chance to look at the minutes? First of all, let me just see, if, is, has everybody had a chance to read the minutes? I think so. Yes, I think we, I think we have all done that, Heather. Are there any, is there any commentary to those minutes? Are any emendations that anybody needs or would like to recommend? I I had a comment on the September twenty first minutes. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Um, Heather, you 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 stated that you 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 list the recommendations where we don't need to do site visits, um, but actually in the meeting we all agreed that we did want to see the Assabet River Bridge and agreed oh. that we would add that to the list. So I think that Correct. should be documented. Thank you. Sarah, that's a good catch. Thank you very much. You're yeah. welcome. And that was great to see. Yeah, wasn't that fantastic to see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was not- an imagination, but it was great. That I, that I could have imagined without us being over there. I mean, it was mm -hmm. really- Exactly. Fun. We were blessed it was with quite, it. was quite the exercise moving from one <laughs> to another with, uh, yeah. with Marsha. I should have been here for the clock tower at the church. That's <laughs> 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 pretty, um, pretty risky. <laughs> hearing hearing um, that, that with that, um, with that, uh, that um, recommendation for change, can I hear somebody move that we accept the minutes with that emendation, please? I so move. Thank you, Nancy. Are you approving the three sets? So it's August 17th, September 21st, and then the September 25th site visits. I just want to clarify. Yeah. That's what, those are the ones I've read. Thank you um, for the dates. Yeah. Do we hear? I would second that motion. Thank you very much, Peter. 
Um, we'll do a roll call and go around. Tom? Aye. Aye. Nancy? Aye. Paul? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Charles? Aye. I've always called Charles. Maybe I'll start calling you Charlie. <laughs> after, no, after, no after I changed my name. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> Peter? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I. So that's the unanimous acceptance, Heather, of your fantastic minutes. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Um, do I hear any new business or any concerns anyone has they would like to bring up at this point? Really uh, fun one. Yeah. Oh, Linda, go ahead. I wanted to thank Linda for, for joining us. Um, actually, I wanted to, yeah. to shout out a, a thank you to our select board member. Linda, do you have something you'd like to add? I always look forward to these meetings and then the comments and the um, good humor that all of you can maintain at the end of a long night. Um, I, I do want to comment. I think it, uh, I appreciated the earlier attention um, that uh, Tom in particular was trying to give to the el eligibility status of two of the proposals. And I think that's probably gonna need some further um, exploration that I'm sure you're on top of. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. I mean, that that kind of attention is is, yeah, is, is critical for everything that we do. It's excellent. I mean, thank and you. I have requested town council's review of all the applications. Um, I'm hoping to get their comments back um, sometime in October. Thank you, Heather, so much. Yeah, good. Uh, so really yeah. fun, really fun and short. Um, the National Park has a new superintendent, Simone Monteleone, who's coming November 7th. And she seems to be a consummate professional, so it should be fun. Well, we'll, look, forward to, we'll look forward to meeting her. Um, thank you all. Uh, may Thanks. I hear a motion to adjourn, please? A motion to adjourn. So, thank you, Paul. Do I hear a second? Second. Tom? Aye. Yes, please, second. Aye. Yes. Nancy? Aye. Paul? Aye. Peter? Aye. Charles? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And I too. Um, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks when we have our next presentations. And again, Heather, will you express our appreciation to Marcia for the work that she did? Thank you.